Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Saints Insider Podcast. I'm Zach Ewing. We're here in our new New Orleans studio. Luke Johnson, Rod Walker, Jeff Duncan with me on this Friday, September the 15th. And uh, these are our new digs, so hope mm -hmm. you like them. Uh, hope we can, uh, we can get you to tune in a couple times a week here from our studio, and we'll be talking some Saints. Today, of course, that means Saints versus Panthers, full preview coming. We've got analysis. We've got breakdown. And we've got predictions for you at the end of the show. Saints Insider podcasts are brought to you by Bank Plus, and uh, away we go, guys. We got Monday Night Football this week. We got Saints. We got Panthers. Um, we're going to do some picks at the end, but uh, let, let's break this thing down, Luke. First of all, we just got the Saints' second injury report of the week. Uh, they'll f have the final one tomorrow on Saturday, but um, looking pretty good. I mean, this team is as healthy as you could expect a team to look during an NFL season. Yeah, I don't think we should be holding on to any idea that it's going to be looking like this <laughs> throughout the course of the season. But week two, got to feel pretty good about where you're at. Obviously, the Peyton Turner thing happened. He went on IR. Um, but when you think about what they have uh, going on this injury report right now, Kendra Miller looks pretty promising to make his debut this week. Um, and really no other big stars are on this where, where you're really worried about their status for Monday night's game. So... I mean, it could be a whole heck of a lot worse. I think they're feeling pretty good about where they're at. Yeah, and we, we broke down Kendry Miller back at practice, Jeff. The, the running game was not a bright spot last week. Part of that could be Titans running defense. Part of it could be the Saints offensive line woes. Could just be game planning. Now that they have a little more depth back there, do you expect them to try to run the ball more this week? Well, look, I think, I think they knew last week they weren't going to be that successful, but they still needed to try and maintain some kind of balance and keep – the Titans honest, but I don't. I think they were happy with what they got out of the running game. Uh, they knew that the, the game plan was basically going to be based on Derek Carr and that passing attack, and I think it's going to be that way again this week, especially with J.C. Horn out. And then we'll probably talk about that. You know, Luke's talking about injuries. Just think of you the Carolina Panthers, and you've lost your number one corner, getting ready to go against this receiving core. So, uh, Saints much better shape there. But uh, as far as the running game is concerned, I don't think Kendra Miller changes the dynamic in their running game. I really don't. I think they're going to go with Jamal Williams, try to run against that front seven, but they're they're really stout up front. A lot of first-round draft picks on that Carolina defense. Uh, so I think it's going to be tough sledding again this week. And then Rod on the other side of the ball, Carolina's down, I think, both starting guards. Saints defensive front got to be kind of licking its chops a little bit. Yeah, and, you know, they're playing a, a rookie quarterback. I think they'll definitely try to make it as uncomfortable as they can for him. And I think that, you know, they, they were able to do that last week against Ryan Tannehill. I think if they can do the exact same thing, I think you can see some of those same um, I guess things could force some turnovers and do some of the things that they were able to do last week against uh, the, the Titans. Yeah, and, and we talked to Joe Woods about that today, uh, Saints defensive coordinator, um, the, the pass rush and the secondary, are, you know, they're, they're two parts of the same coin, right? They're all working together. Mm -hmm. Um, I, yeah, they had 10 quarterback hits last week, three sacks, and I don't think it's it's a coincidence that they had five opportunities to make interceptions and they actually picked off three of them. This was like such a weakness for them last year was developing that, that pass rush with their front four especially, and I think we saw that last week. Obviously, Tennessee had the, the kind of new offensive line. You didn't really know a lot about it, but if they can continue to get that pressure with that front four, I think we can see more of those types of splash plays in the back end. And, and Bryce Young threw two picks last week for Carolina against against the Falcons. So, um, you know, I don't think he played a bad game necessarily for his first game, but clearly is going to make some rookie mistakes, uh, is, is going to have that problem. So we'll break this down. We're going to start when the Saints have the ball, then we'll switch to when the Saints are on D. We'll hit special teams, we'll hit injuries, all those sorts of things, and then we'll make our predictions at the end. So... When the Saints have the ball, guys, and we touched on it, Rod, with the running game, but uh, what we've been talking about all week is, is this confidence and this newfound almost swagger in the downfield passing game. And without J.C. Horn, as Dunk mentioned, there's no reason not to expect that to continue. Yeah, I, th I think they'll be successful doing that. The big question mark, of course, is protecting Derek Carr. Carolina has some really good edge rushers, and, you know, you look at guys like Derek Brown and Brian, Br Brian Burns, I mean – if they can protect Derek Carr, I think this team will be able to take a lot of big shots down the field. I think that's going to be a really big key of this game. So we'll be watching Trevor Penning just like we've been watching him since our training camp started. Is, is there any reason to think he's 
improving? I mean, is there going to be a moment that clicks? Is this just a gradual improvement we're looking for from Trevor Penning? I think Dennis Allen was asked about it yesterday, Luke. Well, I, I mean, I, I think just from a personal standpoint, I mean, the guy was making his second NFL start last week. It was his seventh overall NFL game. And, and you got to remember the last time he was playing football, he's playing against FCS level competition where he was about a foot and a half taller than everybody he was going up against. So I, I think I think we all understood that there was going to be, and, and Dunk, you pointed this out multiple times throughout training camp, that, that this was going to be a process mm -hmm. for Trevor Penning. And it was not always going to be pretty. But I, I think you can see everything with the player. He's he's huge. He's athletic. He's smart. And he's willing. It, it's all, all the pieces are there. They've got to just get it all to kind of come together. So I think this is going to be something that is going to be ongoing. And there might be games where it looks like it clicks. And then he gets up against, you know, it, maybe even this week, a guy like Brian Burns. I mean, if I was Carolina, they move Burns all over the, all over the field. If mm -hmm. I were them, I'd be like, you're lining up right over the left tackle every play until they can until they show they can stop it so he, he's going to get a lot of that stuff I, I think it's it's going to be it's going to be time and there's going to be times where it looks like it's working and then you take a step back and try to take two steps forward after that. and look here's the other thing i'd say it helps having james hurst playing next to him i mean james hurst is a veteran guy uh you know really good mentor for him to have and i think that's a big reason why he's starting right now they want him to work with pinning and help him and they're going to have to mix up some of their protections, use the tight end sometimes, use the back shaded to his side. Uh, they're smart in that way. I, I think they learned a lot in that first half uh, last week, and I think they'll have a plan, and certainly Carolina saw it. There's no doubt. And uh, But he has all the tools. It's just a matter of can he put it together. Now, who knows? I mean, none of us know. It's Like Luke said, it's his second game coming up in his really his NFL career for all intents and purposes We'll see how this plays out, but uh, you know he's got the ability. There's no doubt. Yeah, I mean they keep going back to him, and you mentioned he's a foot and a half taller than FCS guys. He's still bigger than almost everybody. I mean they, he's, it's it's really hard. It's really hard to be on an NFL football team and have somebody like just stand out and be like, ah, that guy's huge. You know? Yeah. He's the tallest guy on the roster, and he's the heaviest guy on the roster, and he's like a freak athlete, and like he's not. It's not like he's he's the kind of guy who's just carrying a bunch of extra weight. You know, it is like he is solidly put together. I, I, the the uh, analogy I always use for him is if like you're a Game of Thrones fan, he looks like the mountain. Like he's <laughs> he's a huge, huge muscular person, uh, and I mean, you know, you you see guys like that flame out, right? I, like it happens. It's not like a guaranteed predictor of success if you're just this like huge bulky athlete. But uh, like I, I just keep thinking that they've got smart offensive line coaches there uh, who just over and over and over have just like told us like this guy has it it's going to be there it's just going to take him a while to get there and it looks like i don't know if you all agree but like it looks like he's just pressing a little bit uh, almost thinking too much you know there's just it's all going to eventually come together for him but right now you can just see uh you know he's he's just a work in progress and his mind is churning even at left tackle we tend to think oh, all he's got to do is just block well no, there's a lot there's a lot that goes into that in, in, in trying to marry up his fundamentals with his pass sets. And these defensive ends and these pass rushers are ruthless, man, and they know it. So right now it's almost like a, a feeding frenzy, I think, until he gets and shows that he can, he can do this on a consistent level. He's going to have to rise to the challenge. And with these younger guys, I mean, you always hear them talking about the game slowing down for him, and I think for him it just hasn't slowed down for him yet, and I think eventually it will as the season goes along. Yeah, I mean, there's a reason they're going to keep going to him and not say, oh, it was a bad half, we got to bench him. I know some people were saying that at halftime of the Titans game. You can't, you're not going to do that. <laughs> oh, well, Luke would have done I'm, it. I might have thrown a tweet out there. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I tweeted it out as well. It did, it did get pretty bad. I mean, honestly, it did. But they, they were able to fix it. And, and then the other part of the, this equation, and Luke, you wrote about Chris Olave today. You're going to write about Rashid Shahid this weekend. If you can give Derek Carr even a little bit of time, he now has these weapons that the Saints haven't had in a while. Michael Thomas would get the bobblehead up there like like he's back. Uh, they, they've got some real potential for a downfield passing game here. Yeah, yeah, and we, you didn't even bring up Juwan Johnson, who I think, you know, even though he didn't have a big game the other day, I think he's still in line for a huge season. Mm -hmm. um, they have really – I was talking to James Hurst after the game, um, and I was asking him specifically just about the team trusting Derek Carr in that fourth, uh, fourth late in the fourth quarter – 
game on the line, putting the ball in his hands and letting him throw down field to Shahid. And like he, his eyes just went wide after the game. He's like, I mean, I'm looking around the huddle and we've got, you know, Shahid and Alave and Mike, and we're going to have Alvin. We got Juwan and you know, last year's NFL rushing touchdown champ. He's like, all we need to do is give him time. Because really, I, you saw what Shahid can do. <laughs> you know, I, I, I mean, he's got like elite different level speed it, it's 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 the same sort of thing we we're talking about with trevor penning where you're a big dude standing out in the nfl like his speed stands out even among some of the world's best athletes and you add to that that they're finding ways to to move these guys around and get them in space to where they can catch a ball chris Olave had twice as many yards after the catch in this game that he'd ever had in an nfl game granted he only played 15 games as a rookie but small sample size really encouraging sample size uh, Mike Thomas going for 25 yards in the first play of the game. Uh, you know, we, we mentioned Alvin Kamara coming back in in just two short weeks from now. Uh, like, they have potential to be really, really explosive this year on offense. It's up to Pete Carmichael to find ways to get those guys the ball. Yeah, Chris Olave, Rod, like, he, he, he had the look of that guy who, oh, oh yeah, it's third and eight, you need a big catch? Come to me. I'll, I'll figure out a way to get those, those 10 yards. Yeah, you know, I'll – Last season, we were, I were kind of, we kind of looked at him as the second receiver behind. This is before Michael Thomas got hurt. We thought he was like, but this is kind of his team now. He's the he's the wide receiver one in this locker room, and, and I think you're seeing it. And he, he talked. You could tell he was confident throughout the preseason. He wa- he wanted to get better, and he wants to be the best receiver in the league. And he looked like he's trending in that direction. I, I tell you another thing, and no one's really talked about this. I, th- I think Taysom Hill referred to this early in the off season about Derek Carr, and it might be worth pursuing as a story, but he seems to throw, like, a really catchable ball. I know that sounds kind of crazy, but, like, you don't see them drop any. I don't think they had any drops in the game. We haven't seen a ton of drops in camp. And I think there's something to that. You know, he his ball is just seems very catchable, and um, there's an art to that. I think Taysom was saying he knows when to zip it in there and when to mm-hmm. put a little touch on it. And just watching the game again, I noticed um, – in addition to his accuracy, he just seems to have the right amount of uh, spin on the ball and the right amount of torque on it. Uh, so, you know, that's that's something that I think can be overlooked. But in that game, in addition to all the wild plays we're talking about, the, you know, the big plays, um, they the receivers did a good job of negotiating the sideline, which is a difficult thing to do. Alave is a master at that. Thomas on that first catch had to navigate the sideline. And also, I think, just showing hands and, and not dropping balls. I mean, we, we've seen that in the past. I mean, Tennessee had a huge drop in, in the game. Yep. So uh, I think it's another another thing to, to to hang your hat on if you're a Saints fan in this offensive attack is that their passing attack, in addition to their quarterback, uh, the receivers showing great ball security. Ask the Kansas City Chiefs if drops matter, if <laughs> receivers matter. I mean, my right. goodness. Um, by, by the way, I, I had my one-on-one interview with Derek Carr, which you can check out on NOLA.com. He's never lost to Carolina. He's only played him twice in his career. Um, but he did tell me this wild story about skateboarding down a hill in Charlotte when his brother played there in 2007 and how he ended up bloodied from, like, <laughs> face to navel. So you got to check that out. Uh, pretty crazy. But let's let's switch gears. You're watching the Saints Insider podcast on NOLA.com and the Saints on NOLA.com YouTube channel. Press the like button, subscribe for us, um, do what you can to help us out, leave a five-star review if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Zach Ewing, Luke Johnson, Rod Walker, and Jeff Duncan. Switching gears to when the Panthers have the ball Monday night. And a, a lot of this, Rod, is going to start with Bryce Young. It's his first home start. It's Monday night football. He was the number one pick. The Panthers mortgaged a good bit of their future, some draft picks, giving up a, a good young receiver in DJ Moore to get this guy. What do they have in Bryce Young? I think they have a quarterback who can extend plays, which, you know, that gives defenses trouble, obviously. And um, he's very accurate. Um, I think, you know, you look at the game last week, Ryan Tannehill missed a couple of big plays that could have very well gone for touchdowns. I don't think Bryce Young will miss those plays. So I think the Saints are going to have to do a really good job of trying to contain him and, you know, keeping him in the pocket and not – and the, the, the DBs are obviously going to have to, you know, make sure they're on their game probably for – a longer amount of time per each on each play. And that, that brings to mind the pass rush. And, again, we talk about the guards being gone, Luke, and for, for Carolina. And, frankly, that was a, a part of their game where they struggled against Atlanta. Bryce Young, whether it was by design or not, was having to get rid of the ball very quickly. So this Saints defensive line, 
a, a pretty encouraging performance against Tennessee, both against the run and the pass, and no reason not to expect they can't do that against Carolina. Uh, only one reason not to expect that, and that is that the Saints have, for whatever reason, uh, just massively struggled against guys who can evade the rush in the pocket and, and move around and buy time with their legs. Um, I don't think Bryce Young is like in the mold of, you know, obviously a Jalen Hurts or Lamar Jackson or whatever the case is. I, I think he's not going to kill him as a runner per se, uh, but he's definitely a guy who can extend plays. And, and I think that, frankly, the Panthers are going to need that against the Saints because their receiving core has like no juice. Um, and I, I think that's a huge advantage to the Saints to a degree. But if he's extending plays and running around in the backfield, um, letting guys have some time to get open, I think that could be a problem for the Saints. But uh, you know, they, the Falcons went up against them. The Falcons are basically a, a northern version of the Saints at this point defensively. They got Ryan Nielsen at D.C. They got a bunch of Saints players over there on that defense, and they fared pretty well against them. So um, you know, maybe the Saints can repeat that. But look, the only, the only hope I think – the Panthers have is is if the officiating crew calls it really tight, you know. I think it's Jeff Novak as the as the referee. Uh, I thought Tolbert on on Sunday let him play, and that plays to the Saints' advantage. The way we know how they played in the secondary, they're very handsy, they're very physical on the outside. They kind of let that go in that game, and I think that plays to the Saints' advantage. If if they're allowed to play that way, I don't see how they're going to get open in the passing game. Uh, they're so limited, like Luke said, uh, at receiver. Um, that there's just no one there that scares you in, in, in the passing game. So they're going to have to run the ball, protect Bryce Young, and I think try to do some trickery or something. We've seen that in the past. I can't remember what game it was. Remember when we were in Charlotte? They, I think they threw like a, a halfback pass, maybe Christian McCaffrey to Chris Manhurts or something. It was a, to the tight end. I mean, they'll, I think they're going to have to do something like that to get a lead and maybe put a little pressure on the Saints. Otherwise, I just can't see them – consistently driving 75, 80 yards against this defense as good as it is and as limited as Carolina is. Yeah, I didn't see LaVisca Chenault going off for like a 70-yard right. touchdown against him last year either. So, um, And he's a good uh, player. I mean, yeah. I, I see them trying to get him involved. And, you know, going back to what we were talking about earlier, there was a really good story in ESPN this week about uh, about how the the deep ball is gone in, in, college, in, in the NFL because so many teams are playing two deep safeties, making you drive the field, almost begging you to run the ball and and, and, and basically rolling the dice that you're eventually going to make a mistake, you know, create a penalty, drop a ball or whatever. And uh, so the, the, there's a premium now on people that can run, receivers that can run after the catch. The Debo Samuels of the world, we're seeing the Saints try to do that more in their offense. Short passing game, get the ball in the hands of Rashid Shaheed, get the ball in the hands of, of Olave, which hasn't been traditionally a strength for him. But I, I think, you know, the, the days of dropping back and throwing it 50 yards down the field, like, uh, you know, Daryl LaMonica or something is, it's kind of out the window. Just you don't see that very often. What a pull, Daryl LaMonica. Going down. Yeah, Dan Fouts might have, I, I would have taken Dan Fouts for an old, <laughs> but, but yeah. <laughs> and anyway, <laughs> DJ Chark limited practice uh, for the, for the Panthers the last two days. I mean, I think he's probably their top receiver, which that, that right there tells you it's not a strong, re re nothing against DJ Chark, but if he's your top guy, it's not that strong, not that deep of a receiving core. And he's limited. He didn't play last week. Seems to me like he's trending toward like a questionable tag for Monday night. So, Rod, I mean, you you better have guys who create separation against this secondary, and it does not seem like the Panthers have that. Yeah, this is a secondary that they play really physical, and that's been like one of their strengths. I mean, I know Don Domingo's still there. He's a rookie who they drafted, who they, they think is going to be really good. But I just don't know if they have the weapons to to match up with this Saints secondary, especially if it's the same Saints secondary that we saw you know, last week. And I think that's what we're going to see from the, from the Saints. And, and you, Rod, you're writing about this for this weekend, but the Saints haven't allowed 20 points in a game. And that's, that's obviously not all defense because you got to avoid turnovers and special teams mistakes and things like that. But um, you, this is a defense that just makes you earn everything. Yeah, you look at last week, I mean, the Titans had to settle for field goals every time they, you know, every time they scored. So, um, yeah, this is a defense that's going to make you work. And it's a credit to Joe Woods. He's able to keep – what this defense had a season ago, they're able to be just as efficient as they were last season, and you know it gives teams trouble. Let's pivot to special teams for a minute on Saints Insider Podcast. We're previewing Saints and Panthers Monday Night Football, six fifteen p.m. Um, on ESPN. Luke, you talked to Blake Groupie for a few minutes yesterday. 
he, he just doesn't seem like he changes much. I mean, he's, he's exactly what you want in a kicker. The guy nailed three field goals. He was instrumental in that victory, a 52-yarder. And he's just kind of like this, got this whatever attitude about it. Yeah, yeah, this is a great thing about being on camera. Okay, so I'm going to do a Blake Groupie impression. I went up <laughs> to him, and I was just like, I was like, hey, man, debut, you know, big game. Were you feeling any nerves? He's like, <laughs> had some butterflies before the game, but yeah, that's once I get out there, I was fine. It's like, okay. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Mm -hmm. If I'm going out there, 70,000 people, I'm a rookie uh, making my debut in the building where they just, you know, traded the guy who's been here for six years and set the franchise accuracy record I, i'd feel pretty nervous i mean maybe he was maybe it's just blowing it off but i don't know I, I think the guy is has the exact trait that you want out of the specialists and particularly out of the kicker in that like the the heart rate is like incredibly low and there's there's not too much of this and this and this it's just steady Seems like um, the kind of guy who could fall asleep on the sideline. Like yeah, this. yeah. Well, well, and then and then you hear you hear uh, uh, Darren Rizzi talking about him today, and he's just like, you know, he knows that people are gonna see him mm -hmm. and be like, "There's the little guy," and and he's he's not gonna like deal with that or put up with it. He's he's, he's gonna walk into a room with his chest stuck out and be like, "Yeah, I'm, this is this is how I look," but I'm I'm gonna go out there and boot a 52 yard field goal with no problem so i, I mean i honestly i think it was really really encouraging to, that he goes out there and he gets four chances and he converts all of them he's responsible for 10 of their 16 points in that game um and you know that's a, a hell of a debut for a guy who who you know it, they they got rid of will lutz you know, to keep him on the roster who missed an extra point by they the missed way an extra Denver, point yeah. I, and a field goal I, I think the field goal is like 54 yarder but still you know it's uh it's it's a it's a really really strong debut for him, and he looks like a he looks like a good get for the And you Saints. know what Rizzy Rizzy said he was jacked up, and his kickoffs kind of showed it. I mean, he was launching his kickoffs, but you couldn't see it in his demeanor at all. So you know, he, but he did say he was jacked up on the sidelines, excited, but but I think on the on the surface you couldn't tell. Uh, so One of the things I talked to him about before the first game, you know, he talked about when he made that transition from Arkansas State to Notre Dame. That was the reason he did it. He wanted to kick on that big stage and he said that really prepared him for this so yeah i mean the college game football, in you got to be impressed college football these days has bigger crowd well not not just these days but you, you actually play in front of bigger crowds in college than you do in the nfl so i suppose that that part of it he was prepared for uh, another another factor of special teams lynn bowden was activated or taken off the practice squad onto the active roster D are we going to see a change at return uh, i'll just leave this open to any of you guys of rashid shaheed Obviously, has a lot of offensive responsibilities. He did fumble the opening kickoff last week. Is is that a possibility where we see more guys get a chance there? Um, I actually asked uh, Rizzy about Bowden as a return guy, and and he said that he does have the ability. But just from the the answer um, I got from him, I, I think I'd be surprised if they made a, a change there. I think they really they, they think Shahid has a chance to be just like a, like an elite NFL returner. Um, and you know maybe they'll they'll take their their chances with him playing there and, and you know risking losing an offensive weapon on, on that side of the ball, but they they think he can be like a game changing type of player there, uh, which so it, it would surprise me if if Bowden ended up just taking over that role entirely. Special teams though, Dunk really strong performance I think outside of that obviously you don't want to fumble the opening kickoff that's as bad <laughs> as you can start, but between that the block punt by Zach Bond who Luke talked to him about doing that in front of Steve Gleason. Uh, a pr pretty good cover kick coverage, making the kicks, pretty good punts. I mean, that's that's what winning football teams do. Well, if you look at just the second half of that game, um, I think the Saints' last 13 points were scored after either turnovers or the block punt, which kind of is like, is like a takeaway. In, in a game like that, I mean, that's critical. Uh, you know, the offense really didn't have to drive 80 yards. They, they were set up with a lot of short fields, and um, that's complimentary football. That's what Dennis Allen believes in. And I think it's going to be another game like that this week, man. I think it's going to be another low-scoring defensive battle. I think it's the only way Carolina can be in this game is if they keep the Saints in, in the teens below 20. I don't think they can get into a, a shootout with them at all. Uh, so in a game like this, we'll see. It's going to be outdoors. I've, been covered, I've covered a lot of games at this stadium in the past. It can get windy, which could affect the kicking game as well. And the return game was probably the only thing that seemed to be an area they need to improve – you know, aside from the fumble, they, I think they started a few drives inside their 25, and Dennis Allen was talking about that. Uh, but I don't have any concerns with Sheed. I mean, he's a special talent. 
uh, as a as a return guy. I mean, he, if he gets a seam, he can take it to the house. So, um, to me, it was a, it was a, a strength for this team. I think it's going to be a strength all season. Yeah. All right. So so you you mentioned keeping Carolina in the teams or Carolina keeping the Saints in the teams. Let's do some predictions. Uh, we'll go from from right to left here as we sit and uh, give us a key to the game and then your prediction, Luke. I think the key to the game has got to be to keep Derek Carr upright. Um, I think that's this is the one area where we've we've seen this team struggle uh, against Carolina in recent years. It seems like uh, you know whether it's Jameis Winston or whoever the, whoever else the quarterback has been has been on their back a lot. Uh, if they can keep Derek Carr upright, I mean I, I just have so much faith in those receivers against this Carolina secondary. Um, and I, you know after seeing that defensive performance in Week One from the Saints. I really have a lot of faith against their defense, against Carolina's offense. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll give uh, Carolina some some points for for hosting the game Monday night. A lot of emotions there with Bryce Young's first career start in that building. But I think it's going to be a, a, a pretty convincing win for the Saints. I'll go 27 to 20. All right, my key to the game, penalties. Dunk, you mentioned it. If they're calling the game tight, the Saints secondary especially is going to have to be real careful about not giving up free yards, not giving up big plays on the penalties. If they can do that, I just don't see any way Carolina consistently moves the ball on this team. And so I go with a similar margin as Luke. Saints may have to work for their points. They may have a few drive stall with sacks and things like that. Uh, but I go 19-13 Saints, kind of a tight game like last week, and uh, they, they get it done. Rod? I think the defense is going to dominate this game like they've done the last nine games. They haven't allowed anybody to score over 20 points in nine games in a row. And I just think that's going to continue. I think containing Bryce is going to be the key to this game. They can't give up the big plays, though. I mentioned the ones from last week that they that could have been big plays that weren't. I think that's the only way that Carolina can actually score on this team is if, you know, a coverage breakdown or something like that. But I don't see them just driving up and down the field against the Saints. So I think I had it like 20 to 6, maybe. 20 to 6, dominating defensive victory. So we're, we're all going to pick the Saints, right, Tony? Uh No, no, <laughs> we're not. See, I'm going to be a little different here. Look, I think they're still going to hold another opponent under 20, and I think they're still going to lose. Uh, because I, I think the one thing that concerns me, uh, you know, last week we saw Derek Carr throw a pick. We saw another play that could have been a touchdown and go the other way, got got overturned or, or upheld by the officiating. It was a very close call. That's what worries me is, is a defensive touchdown in that environment. Luke mentioned it's going to be amped. It's their home opener. It's Bryce Young's debut. It's, it's primetime game. I've just covered so many games in that environment where the Saints are the better team and they come out of there with a loss. It happens all the time, especially with a desperate team that lost their opener. I mean, they're going to be the more desperate team. It's just human nature. Uh, so crazy things happen for some reason in Charlotte. Uh, so I picked the Saints 17-16 against the red zone. You picked pick the Panthers. I, I mean, Panthers 17-16. Thank you. And I think the red zone is going to be the key. I mean, we saw last week it was a problem for the Saints offensively. It's historically been a problem for Derek Carr, and I think if they can't score touchdowns and they have to settle for field goals, that could come back to, to bite them. We'll, we'll close with this, and, and I mean, I do think, obviously, starting 1-0 and is important. This is a big spot in the schedule, though. Four of their next five games are on the road. I, I mean, Rod, you were the only one who picked against the Saints last week. We only have one <laughs> this week. But, but I guarantee you next week probably more than one of us are going to pick the Packers against the Saints. It's a, it's a tough spot. It's a short week. It's another road trip. It's, it's just all of these schedule things in the NFL that are going against the Saints next week. Um, and then, then they come back home for the Bucs, and they have two more road games, Boston and Houston, back-to-back -back weeks. So you want to take care of this game where you're ostensibly the better team before things can snowball on you. You kind of stop that before it starts. And historically, the Saints haven't done well in week two. They haven't won. They haven't been 2-0 since 2013. Yep. They've won, what, five straight openers now? Yes. So it's the second game that always gives them fits for whatever reason. So starting off 2-0 would be really huge for this team, especially when you look at the rest of that schedule. And didn't you, didn't you try out some stat about second week or – the teams it one and, one and O teams are win sixty five percent of the time against O and one teams, and it's even higher than that when they're at home. So it's a it's, it's a tough spot, it's a tricky spot, but I mean, I, it's a it's a game the Saints should probably win on paper. Yeah, I mean, I I I, I like how I like how Jeff you you point out like uh, there's a very narrow path for Carolina to take here, and you, then you're like you they're going to take it. They're going to take it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it is what happens. It's but, what happens. It's yes, all the I, time. I, how many look, times what happened last year? I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if the Saints lost. Right? right, like we saw them in 2021, 
blow out the Packers, who I exactly. think were a lot of people's Super Bowl favorites going into that year. They beat them by 35 points, and then they go and get just manhandled in Carolina the next week. Like, this sort of thing happens. I just don't think it's going to happen this time. Maybe yeah. I'm wrong. But it is really important because, A, it's a division game. They went 2-4 and four in the division last year, and it's the whole reason they were irrelevant in Week 18 because um, those were they were winnable games that they just did not – did not come through in and that's the the, the most important thing is right. taking care of the division so I, I that's this is a huge game for that reason and then when you consider two of their next three are against probably the two toughest opponents they'll have in the first half of the season maybe with the jaguars being the the exception um uh, and they're both on the road new um england. in new england and green bay i, I mean they gotta they gotta take care of business this week uh if they want to finish where they expect to finish Saints will either be 2-0 and and have some pretty good margin for error over the next few weeks, or they'll be 1-1, one and one, and uh, that finger will start to hover over the panic button for uh, for Houdat Nation. So that, we'll, It's always yeah, there. One or the other. It's, <laughs> it's always within reach, right? <laughs> but it'll, it'll start, they'll take the cover off of that panic button if, uh, if they lose this game again in Carolina. So we'll be there Monday night. Uh, we'll have live post-game show, Saints Insider. Check that out 15 minutes after the game. Uh, Rod and Luke will be there with me and we'll from Bank of America Stadium, and we'll talk to you, I, I guess, not too late. It'll be, probably game will be over around 9.15, 9.30 in New Orleans time, so not, not too bad, and we'll go live 15 minutes after that. So check that out on this same SaintsOnNola.com YouTube channel. We appreciate you all for tuning in. Check us out on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Leave us a review and hit the like button and subscribe to the SaintsOnNola.com YouTube channel. For Luke Johnson, Rod Walker, and Jeff Duncan, I'm Zach Ewing. Thanks for watching the Saints Insider Podcast.